The One Piece manga just dropped a ton of shocking new information about some of the most mysterious characters in the entire story. In fact, we now know that the leader of the incredibly hyped up Knights of God has to be somehow related to Shanks. But that's not even the craziest name reveal of this chapter because after decades of mystery, we now finally know the full names and jobs of every single member of the Gorosei. But if you thought that that was it for this chapter, you're completely wrong because we all also learn Emu's ancient family name, plus the true nature of this island destroying weapon that might have the power to destroy the entire world. And with all of the secrets of the world government being revealed right now, they are clearly being set up as the single most powerful group of enemies in the entire story. Amongst others, that is because in this chapter we meet this older looking gentleman with possibly the most epic hairstyle in One Piece, which is saying something, who is called Garth. Figurelands. And we're being told that he is the leader of the Knights of God who protect Marijoa. And now we do know that he is undoubtedly going to be an absolute powerhouse of a fighter, even at his admittedly advanced age. And that is because he has the same family name as Shanks. At least that is extremely likely because the Gorosei speculated that Uta would be a Figurland too if she was Shanks' daughter. And I guess the only way they could come to that conclusion would be if Shanks was was a Figurland. And if you didn't know, in One Piece, power usually is inherited pretty well from generation to generation. So just like Luffy is super powerful in parts because of his ridiculously overpowered grandfather and father, Shanks' power must have partially come down through his family lineage, which should mean that Garling should also be an absolute monster of a fighter. In fact, back in chapter 1082, Buggy even revealed that Shanks always shone so brightly with potential, even from a very young age, so him coming from a super strong family just makes even more sense. And if you have any doubts that Shanks and Garling are absolutely related, then listen to this, because this chapter also very casually dropped one of the most unexpected reveals that I can remember for a long time, because Garling himself is actually the previous king of God Valley. And in case you've forgotten, God Valley was an island where Goldie, Roger, and Garb teamed up to take down the legendary Rocks Pirates which included Big Mom, Kaido, and Whitebeard, and of course, Rox himself. We do know that the Celestial Dragons used to live on this island, however, after this battle, the island was completely wiped off the map. And while Roger rescued little baby Shanks from that island, which by the way, basically confirms, I think, that Garling is Shanks' dad or grandpa or something, since they were both from that island and both Figurelands, I personally never really expected to meet someone from God Valley. So it was a complete shock to see the former king, who must surely know many of the secrets of what took place on that day, including the true reason that Rox attacked God Valley in the first place and what actually happened to the notorious pirate. But all of that will surely be revealed in the future. And this brings up a few burning questions though, like what are Garling's powers and who are the rest of these incredible protectors of Marijua? Really, I only see two options for the rest of the Knights of God here. The first is that Garling here could just be their leader and the rest of them are all other super strong fighters, not necessarily related to the Figurland family, it could even be that they are the strongest celestial dragons from the other original 20 ruling families. I will say though, to me personally, the other and much more interesting possibility is that the Knights of Gods are entirely made up of this Figurland family. And you might be asking, well, why is this the more interesting option? Well, that's simply because if Garling is Shanks' father, grandfather, uncle, I mean, some other distant relative, then we could see his mother, siblings, or other relatives relatives in the story as well. And if that's the case, then surely we have to see Shanks interact with these people at some point as well. I mean, why else could they be introduced into the story so late? And I'm not sure if this would necessarily mean a fight if Shanks actually comes to Marijua, or maybe Shanks actually gets along with his long lost family and we could see them interact in a more meaningful way. There's also the theory, of course, that Shanks is actually still a member of the Knights of God and and that theory is kind of supported by this famous scene here with Shanks apparently speaking with the Gorosei back in chapter 907. However, I don't really believe this theory, especially because of the possibility that this figure could just 
actually be Shanks' brother or even a twin. And honestly, generally, is it just me or has Oda just been delivering one 11 out of 10 chapter after the next recently? Besides wondering who they are, there's actually even more that we can analyze about the Knights of God from this mind-blowing chapter. And it all starts in the original Japanese because the most literal translation for this group is the Knights of God. And with this translation, I strongly suspect that these knights don't actually serve the entire group of celestial dragons, but instead only serve Emu and maybe the five elders. For one, that's because Figureland here is actually addressed as a saint himself, but it is even more supported by the reveal of the Gorosei's names, which we will be discussing in just a moment. But if they really do only serve the top leaders, then I wonder if they're actually from the Void Century as well. I mean, it's not likely, but maybe the reason that the world government was so desperate to retrieve the Ope Ope no Mi was because they wanted to preserve all of their strongest fighters and not just Emu. I mean, who knows, there could be another magical way to keep people alive, but regardless, we also have a clue that they directly serve Emu back in chapter 908 because when we first see Emu revealed in their garden, you may have ignored the fact, like me, that there is actually some kind of servant in the background as well. And while I've always wondered who would have the right and even know about Emu, it would make sense if that person was actually one of the god knights. In fact, we even see this large sword that Emu uses to cut up the pictures, but Emu doesn't take the sword with them. So it is kind of possible that this sword belonged to the servant, which would be further support to the idea that this is in fact one of the holy knights. And so with this direct chain of command, it makes even more sense that someone like Garling has authority to deal out justice even to the celestial dragons themselves, which is exactly what happened in this chapter because we see this guy, Mjolskart, having been executed because of his support for the Straw Hat Grand Fleet members who beat up the celestial dragon in the last chapter, also because he probably beat him up himself. But on top of that, we actually also know that Mjolskart helped Sai and Leo get away because back in chapter 1054, Akainu, Kizaru, and this other high-ranking marine are actually talking about the event we just saw in the last chapter. And so because of this, he has apparently been executed on the authority of the Knights of God. And while we don't 100% know that they were the actual ones who ordered the execution, we're at least told in chapter 1054 that they have complete authority over anyone in the Holy Land. Although I'll say I'm dying to know what kind of power these Holy Knights actually have. I mean, is it some mysterious power like we just saw with the Gorosei and Emu in the last chapter? Or will it be something a little bit more quote unquote normal like crazy devil fruits and hockey? Well, no matter what the powers of the Knights of God will turn out to be, they are basically spring chickens compared to the insanely destructive powers of this weapon right here. And while we already know what this device's powers can actually do, in this chapter, we learned that this legendary machine is in fact not an ancient weapon, not the weapon Uranus, as many, including me, probably suspected, but instead it seems to be some sort of technology created by the genius scientist, Dr. Vegapunk. And you cannot imagine just how much this would change the direction of the story, because if this thing is really technology that can be recreated, then that means that the world government might be able to make more of those weapons to wildly increase their potential for destruction across the world. And while I don't think that Oda will go full rumbling in the One Piece world here, we have seen super powerful tech be recreated and used in the story before. After all, when we first saw the Cyborg Posse Fista on Saba Odi, we could not imagine that these super powerful robots would become an entire army like they have been at Marineford. Actually, well, hold on. Let's let's back up and add a little bit more context here. Because even though this was made by Dr. Vegapunk, this device could still be related to Uranus in some way or form. Because remember, way back in Ennis Lobby, Frankie had the blueprints to a weapon that was supposed to be able to counter the ancient weapon Pluton. So what if we have a sort of similar situation here, where Vegapunk somehow made a device that is similar or 
even a counter to Uranus, and that is what we are actually witnessing destroying Lelucia. Which is actually even crazier to think about because it seems like the destruction in Lelucia was just a test run to see if the weapon actually works. Because after everything that happened during the Reverie, it seems that the world government decided that they needed to move forward with their great cleansing plans and decided to test out this weapon. And after it was apparently successful in destroying this entire island, they probably thought that they will now no longer actually need Vegapunk and could have him assassinated. Which is actually incredibly sad when you think about it because I wonder if Vegapunk originally made this weapon for something other than destruction, just how Dragon seems to be wondering in this chapter as well. I mean, we have seen in many of the recent cover pages that Vegapunk was pretty much a pacifist, but many of his creations now get used for war and military purposes because they have fallen into the wrong hands. Again, even in this chapter, we do see that Dragon and also Ivankov are shocked that Emo would have created a weapon weapon with the potential for such massive destruction. Honestly, kind of interesting to think about what would have happened if Vegapunk had never even joined the world government in the first place. Might have been the better choice. And actually, there is one more detail about Vegapunk and his connection to this weapon that you might have missed. And that's because back in chapter 1065, the Lilith version of Vegapunk mentioned that it would be great if they had a powerful alternative energy source. And she specifically mentioned the phrase Eternal Flame. And there was actually a ton of speculation about what this could be back when this chapter was released, but now in this chapter, we learned that this destructive weapon is called the Mother Flame, a very intriguing connection, which makes me think that Vegapunk possibly designed this thing to gather energy, and then it was somehow corrupted into a weapon of mass destruction. But all of this talk about the ancient weapons makes me wonder if the original 20 kings actually used the ancient weapons during the Void Century to defeat the ancient kingdom. After all, someone must have had used them at some point before so that everyone knows what they're actually capable of, including destroying entire islands and even the world itself. And if these weapons were indeed used to overthrow Joy Boy, it would actually be kind of fitting that in the present day, they might be used by Luffy and his allies to combat whatever super weapons the world government now possesses. Plus, speaking of crazy super weapons, we finally get to see the Seraphim versions of the other original warlords, specifically Cross Crocodile, Moria, and Doflamingo, who just has crazy- I mean, all of them have swag, but Doflamingo here, fantastic. Which brings up another super interesting question that I've actually been wondering about ever since the Seraphim were introduced. Specifically for Crocodile, and that is, was Vegapunk actually able to recreate Logia Devil Fruits using the green blood technology? Because so far, all of the other Seraphim have only had Paramecia type Devil Fruits, so it will be incredibly interesting to see if he was able to give Escroc the Sand Logia powers. And I mean, if he was able to reproduce them, then wow. I mean, is it possible that we will be seeing even more ridiculously powerful Logia Fruit users in the near future. I mean, I wonder if it could even lead to a genetically enhanced type of soldier with insane Logia Devil Fruit powers. Uh, nothing's impossible at this point, but wow. I mean, this is a lot to think about, and all of it has me super excited for what we're about to see in the final battles of the story, but now, more than ever, we seem to know that the Gorosei will actually take part in those battles. And in this chapter, we don't learn any more about their powers, but we do get their full names, titles, and roles as leader of the world government. So let's go through each one of them and see what types of secrets we can learn here. And first of all, each of the Gorosei has the title of Warrior God, Senshi no Kami in Japanese. And this actually further supports the idea that they are fighters, but also is interesting in another way because they're specifically called gods here. And as we all know, they're not the first self-proclaimed god that we have seen in the One Piece world. Of course, the Lightning Fruit user Enel called himself a god of Skypiea before he was then defeated by the Straw Hats. The Celestial Dragons basically considered themselves gods. The Lunarians were once considered a tribe of gods, plus the D-Clan is known as the natural enemy of the gods. So clearly, the Ds will be opposing these warrior gods in the near future. And in fact, now that you mention it, the way that these five are titled kind of reminds me of uh, these guys here. Now, all of these have specific roles under Enel, 
Nil and were all defeated by various Straw Hats and, of course, this guy. So, is this a hint that the Gorosei might fall in a similar way later on in the story? Anyways, let's start with Saint Ethan Baron von Nasujuro, who is the warrior god of finance. Now, there are a few details here that we can actually pull from this name and his title. First, my original idea from chapter 1073, the review I did back then, was that each of the Gorosei were related to planets in the solar system, and this turned out to be basically true. I mean, although we have to play with the names a little bit here to make it work, for Ethan Baron we can basically make Venus by combining the V and the Nasu to make Venus. It is his first name, I think, that is especially interesting here. That's because the Judo portion of Nasu Judo bears a strong similarity to some names that we do know from Wano. For example, Zoro was called Zoro Judo by many of the Wano citizens, so it is actually possible that this man is originally from Wano. Plus, he wields what many suspect is the Shodai Kitetsu, which is one of the most famous cursed blades from Wano. But enough about his name. We also learned that his responsibility is related to finance. However, one thing that is kind of unclear about each of the Gorosei's role so far is whether this responsibility extends to the entire world and all of the kingdoms part of the world government, or if their roles only deal with Marijoa. And honestly, it is probably a mix between the two depending on the Gorosei, because in this case, I could see that Saint Ethan Baron could be in charge of the heavenly tribute, which world government kingdoms are required to pay. Now next up is Saint Marcus Mars, who is the warrior god of the environment, and I'll be honest, I really don't have a great idea for what this guy's role in the world government is supposed to be. I mean, environment is basically as vague as it gets a term, and unless he's somehow in charge of the weather and can alter the weather all around the world, or maybe they really do worry that too much technology will be bad for the environment. I mean, who knows, maybe they have climate change in One Piece. Another possibility is that he could be the one in charge of this giant bridge that you probably all forgot about, but I'm really not 100% sure about this one. However, his first name is Mars, so there's an easy one for the planets here. Interestingly, Marcus is an ancient Roman name, including one of the most famous emperors, Marcus Aurelius. Also, interestingly, Aurelius was known as one of the five good emperors and the last emperor of the Pax Romana, which was an age of peace and stability for the Roman Empire, which does seem kind of similar to the era of One Piece, although it hasn't been <coughs> entirely peaceful. Let's Put it that way, maybe. And then we have Mr. Mustache himself, Saint Topman Valkyrie, what an epic name, who is the warrior god of legal affairs. And there's a few things that stick out to me right away. First off, Valkyrie is a clear reference to the Nordic Valkyrie, who were mythological female warriors who usually guided the dead souls to Valhalla. Now, my initial thought was, could this mean that he might be from Elbaf, since that is a country based on Nordic mythology? And it is a little bit harder to connect his name to a planet it, but I have seen someone successfully combine the man and Curie to make something like Mercury, so we'll count this one as well. Now, in terms of his role in the government, legal affairs remind me a lot of the judicial island of Ennis Lobby and the prison in Pull Down, so perhaps it was his job to oversee these important government facilities. So maybe he's the one to ask if the One Piece is actually at the bottom of the hole underneath Ennis Lobby, and he would probably also be the one who's the most unpleased about the Straw Hat since they busted both in Pull Down and Ennis Lobby. And moving on, we're now going to Saint Shepherd Jew Peter. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Who is the warrior god of agriculture? And this blonde fellow is clearly tied to the planet Jupiter. Now, as far as other secrets from his name, it could have been inspired by Saint Peter, who was one of Jesus' first disciples in the Christian Bible. So perhaps this means he was also one of Emu's first followers when they took power over the world government. In Catholicism, they also believe that Saint Peter guards the pearly gates, which is basically the gates that someone must pass through to go into heaven. Uh, we do have the gates of justice, so might make sense. They are connecting kind of all of these locations that we talked about, and this lobby, Impel Down, and of course, uh, Marine Fort, or at least what's left of Marine Fort. And St. Shepard's role in the government is agriculture. Though honestly, this one is also a bit of a head scratcher for me. I mean, clearly it does seem to deal with food in some way or form, but farms and other agriculture are not super common in the One Piece world. So I'm kind of wondering if he's just in charge of food on Marijoa, or if again, it's kind of encapsulating the entire world. And you might have actually forgotten that we have seen islands specifically related to food before. In fact, in chapter 827, we see a few of Big Mom's 
children stealing flour, eggs, and fruit from islands that are designed specifically for these fruits. So maybe Saint Shepherd is the one who is in charge of these types of islands only on a world scale. But then again, some people consider fishing a part of agriculture too, and there is certainly a lot of fish in the One Piece world, so it might just be that. And then we have Saint J. Garcia Sadden, and while we already knew his name, we now also know that he is the warrior god of scientific defense, which actually perfectly explains why he's coming to Egghead Island, since his role in the government is basically to oversee the technology that is mostly developed by Vegapunk. But now that we do know all of their names, we can add these to the list of the nine original ruling families that we currently know about. These family names are the Nefatari, Jay Garcia, Marcus, Topman, Shepard, Ethan Barron, Don Quixote, Figureland, and Nerona. Which, if you read this chapter, you will know that there was actually a Saint Emu from the Nerona family among the first original ruling family. So here they seem to be, your secret ruler of the world, Nerona Emu. Which is kind of crazy that we went five years basically knowing nothing, and now in three chapters we have a ton of insane information about them. But let's explore all of the secrets that we can speculate based on what was revealed in this chapter. First off, because there was a Saint Emu, we have to wonder if this Emu in the present story is actually the same one from the Void Century, or if they are a descendant of the original Saint Emu who somehow took power over the worlds. And I mean, who knows, there could even be some other interesting body swapping shenanigans going on here, since that was another key power that Doflamingo highlighted from the Ope Ope no Mi. And now that we have their family name, I'm super curious if we could eventually see someone else with that name as well in the story. I mean, certainly if Emu is a descendant of the original ruler, there would have been another member of the family, specifically Emu's parents, for instance. But we'll have to wait and see if such a person actually exists and what role they could possibly play in the story. However, that's of course not even the most interesting thing here though, because the actual name Nerona may reveal some more secrets about Emu itself on its own. Now, we already mentioned St. Marcus's possible connections to ancient Rome, but did you know that Nero is another infamous Roman emperor? And pretty much unlike Emu, Nero's rule was incredibly chaotic, as he was known for his cruelty and selfish behaviors. However, interestingly, Nero was born only a few years after Jesus from the Bible was killed, which is an odd coincidence with Emu and the world government taking over the world by defeating Joy Boy, who was possibly called the Sun God. Beyond that, Nero was eventually betrayed by the Roman Senate, and after his death, Rome had a brief period of civil war, which might actually fit pretty well with One Piece, considering we're technically about to enter a civil war between the world government and the revolutionary army. But enough history, because there is at least one character in the story who thinks that Emu is immortal, and that is the revolutionary Ivankov, who speculates in this chapter that Emu received the perpetual youth surgery from a former user of the Ope Ope no Mi. Which honestly is not surprising, I mean, we've all been speculating about this possibility for years, but it is interesting honestly seeing it brought up as an option for the first time in the story as well. But then you know what's coming? Since Oda is actually bringing it up right now, I do wonder if this is not just another red herring to kind of get us away from the actual source of Emu's abilities. And all of these secrets are about to spark an unbelievable era of chaos in the One Piece world because we leave off this chapter with Big News Morgans hinting that he's about to send out his loyal flock of news coups with information that will shake the world. And it's pretty easy to guess that he's going to spill the beans about Emu, but maybe it will also also include some other secrets about the world government, Emu, or even the poster boy of the revolutionary army himself, Sabo, because more than ever, it seems like Sabo will be playing a much larger role in the story than anyone could have ever imagined when he was first reintroduced into the story as an adult way back in chapter 98. Wait, hold on. Chapter 98? Yeah, that's right. I bet you didn't know that Sabo was probably shown in the manga right here all the way back in Loketown. And if you want to hear more about that and 100 other incredible secret facts about One Piece you probably didn't know, then you can watch that video right here. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out Holtz Current and their insane products. And uh, I'll see you in the next one.